In 2050, the number one job in the world will be carbon wrangling. Just get into the electricity sector in general. All electricity companies, whether they know it or not, are renewable energy companies. My advice for breaking into the clean energy world is to follow the money. Don't hesitate to get involved. Don't wait for things to land on your doorstep. Go out and get it. We know that the sustainability landscape and green jobs are ever evolving, and we need to prepare young people better for this. Hi, I'm Ed Whittingham, and you're listening to Energy vs. Climate, the show where my co-hosts David Keith, Sarah Hastings-Simon, and I debate today's energy challenges, highlighting the Albertan and Canadian context. If this is your first time joining us, Energy vs. Climate is a live webinar and podcast that drops every other week. Visit energyversusclimate.com to register for updates and get exclusive access to join our live webinars, ask us questions, and engage with us directly. This week, we have a very special show. David, Sarah, and I often get questions on how each of us got into the low-carbon energy field. So today, we're dedicating the entire episode to advice for people looking to start or transition their careers in low-carbon energy. To give you a full range of perspectives across sectors and a variety of voices, we put a call out to friends and colleagues to offer their advice as well. You'll get all their tips and tricks. As you'll hear, there are countless ways to get into the industry. We hope the show will be a resource to share for all you listeners who get similar questions, whether they be from students, mid-career professionals, or frankly anyone looking to get into low-carbon energy. So let's kick things off with a clip. Hello, Energy versus Climate. My name is Jeremy Barreto, and I'm a partner at Castles based in Calgary. I practice regulatory, environmental, and Aboriginal law with a focus on renewable energy. Thank you for asking me what advice I would give to someone who's looking to start or transition their career in low carbon energy, particularly in the legal field. My main advice would be to identify what you want to do and then find a way that you could make it into a, a career or a job. By that, I mean, when I started out in renewable energy, many senior lawyers told me that in their view, it was a charity and not a business. At the time, I found this very interesting because many places around the world, renewable energy was a multi-billion dollar industry even two decades ago. I stuck with it, wrote articles, attended conferences, even if renewable energy was not the majority of what I did. Over time, as the industry grew and especially grew in Western Canada and Alberta, I was perfectly positioned to work in this area and to serve clients across the country and around the world with their rural rural energy and other low carbon energy matters. Thank you and good luck with your career path. You know, I'm going to jump in and and thanks, Jeremy. It reminds me of a a couple of things. I was chatting with an old Pemina colleague not long ago and now heads up greenhouse gas management for one of the big gas companies. And we're joking that 15 years ago, when we were working together, it couldn't have been more fringe based on the perspective of someone within the, the oil and gas industry in particular. And, you know, what a, what a difference, what a, a world of difference we are now here 15 years later. It's, it's completely mainstream. Um, and so folks trying to get into the, the low carbon energy industry, you have to know that the absorption capacity for people interested and with the skills is just multiple times more than what it was years ago. Uh, And the other thing, Jeremy, you know, you kind of talked about just, you know, not listening to the naysayers and doing it yourself, writing your papers. I, when I was doing my grad studies, I wanted to do sustainability consulting through the, a student consultancy that was at the school. I met with the director and he kind of laughed at me because again, it was fringe. So with another fellow, Big shout out to Duncan Kenyon. We started Canada's first grad student-led sustainability consultancy at York Sustainable Enterprise Consultants, still running to this day because it didn't exist. So we just said, we'll do it. We'll get the practice. And uh, we actually ended up creating a little vehicle and tooting my own horn that that is uh, sort of providing useful service to uh, students today. So if it isn't there, just create it. Someone else? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in and just say... Um, I love the way his comment reflected the unwillingness of the Calgary kind of business and oil patch world to accept the reality that Clean Deck was moving a long time ago. That was a really telling anecdote. 
Yeah, I think that, you know, just timing is everything. And I do think like Ed, like you said, you know, without giving away Jeremy's age, that his this process was he was facing a different market than we are today. But the other thing that really stands out to me from what he did is sort of you don't have to go into, you know, purely working in the low carbon energy space in the beginning. Right. So he always had that as kind of a piece of what he was doing. And then that grew and grew over time until that was sort of his main focus. So I think that's also, you know, whether you're just starting out and trying to get into the space and you can't, you know, find that that full job that what you're looking for or you have an existing career and you're looking to transition this idea that it doesn't have to be an all at once thing, but sort of look for ways to grow it over time. I think it's a really good perspective. I'm Jackie Forrest, ARC Energy Research Institute Executive Director and co-host of the ARC Energy Ideas podcast. Uh, here's some career advice when thinking about going into energy transition. When you're thinking about doing something new, don't be afraid to take a step back in compensation or seniority from where you are today. Just trust that as you establish yourself in this new area, you will get back to where you were before, especially if you're passionate and excited about what you do. Success will always follow. I've got to jump on this one and, and Ed can maybe add some color too. because I was sure can. I sure can. Much. Knowing your salary, <laughs> your old salary. Very much the story of my having, uh, you know, made the transition from working at McKinsey to being fully in the low carbon energy space at the Pemin Institute with Ed, which was definitely a major a step down in salary level. And so I think that is good advice. You know, at the same time, I actually also want to point out, though, that this is something that especially in the not for profit space and others, we also really need to think about and be aware of, you know, I was able to make that step down because of my, you know, broader situation and the family supports that I have. And and I think one of the failings that, that we maybe have within this industry is really relying on people to have those external supports to be able to make that shift in some cases. And that has big implications for equity. So I did want to note that part. But if you are able to, you know, make that move, and I think people are often told, you know, you should never make a move down in seniority and you should never take Take a pay cut. Um, if you can make it work, it, it can make a lot of sense. And it doesn't mean, you know, I think I, I ultimately ended up in a much more senior position that I left in a, in a relatively short period of time. Yeah, I, I, I've got to jump in because, Sarah, I think you took the all time record step down in salary to come work for the Pemmon Institute. I thought my, like I went in my own story, I did a two year MBA and tuition alone spent. 40 grand to basically go from a $36,000 a year salary in conservation to a $50,000 a year salary in the climate and NGO sector to start. And it doesn't actually take an MBA to figure out that that's pretty, pretty crappy short-term ROI on that two years of tuition and opportunity cost. But I can draw a straight line between that decision and what I'm doing today which what I do today, I love, and I think it's important. And to your point, yeah, it sucks that when we looked at prospective uh, Pembina colleagues, sometimes what his or her spouse did matters. You know, if your spouse was a doctor or a lawyer, that was really helpful. We just got to get salaries overall up across the board, including in nonprofits. So that doesn't have to be a factor. Hi, I'm Mike Kellett, CEO of Planetary Hydrogen. Prior to coming into the clean tech field and carbon tech in particular, I was in the software space for about 20 years. And what's amazing about the space is that everybody's been incredibly welcoming, even though I don't have a background specifically in the science of this. So in the last two years, I've been drinking from the fire hose around atmospheric chemistry and the global carbon cycle and ocean chemistry and all kinds of great topics like that. And while I only still have sort of a bit of a working knowledge around this or, or a maybe an enhanced layperson's knowledge, I find that people in the space are so interested in making sure that you're as successful as you can be, that there's a lot of patience for that. The skills that we use specifically at Planetary Hydrogen, uh, or that I use specifically, are around my entrepreneurial background and my business background, which relates to all of the typical things that you need to do to run a business. That includes everything from finance to HR, to legal, to raising money and pitching and, uh, you know, just generally all of those kinds of skills that are very transferable. But what surprised me the most is that even in the context of clean tech, there's a lot of parallels in terms of how you iterate towards a solution and incrementally develop 
something that you're going to take to market. It's very similar to my background in the software field. So if you're considering a switch over to carbon tech or to clean tech, especially carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere, now's the time. It's a really exciting space. Everybody's jumping on board and trying to leverage their skills towards what is probably the biggest challenge we have as a uh, species on this earth. And there's a ton of communities out there on Slack and in other places that are encouraging people to come and join in, helping people get ideas. So look specifically at, you know, my climate journey, energy versus climate, work on climate, uh, and a variety of those kinds of communities, air miners, great community. And then also I highly recommend looking at some of the fellowship opportunities like the Breakthrough Energy Fellowship and the Carbon 180 Fellowships. Sarah, Mike Kelland of CEO of Planetary Hydrogen, what do you think of his advice? I think it's really interesting. You know, one of the things that stands out to me is this idea that the a lot of the skills are transferable, right? And when we think about especially climate tech, there's there's the tech part that looms large, but a lot of the business of actually scaling these things up and making them to, into a business have little to do with the underlying technology itself. And so I think it's, you know, to, to me, that really shows something that I think also is true, that you can come into this space with, frankly, any kind of background, but you do have to put in the work to learn about the general context in which that lives. So I think that's a you know really important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, you know, I, I think sometimes people fall into the trap of thinking they need to be content specialists, whereas they don't, you know, clean energy or low carbon energy. They need specialized generalists just like any other industry. And I, I think of my own transition into the, the climate energy world. I came from conservation, you know, like bears and bunnies protection. And then I went and I upgraded my BA, my bugger all into an MBA or a master's of bugger all. And I thought when I got into climate energy, I had just enough knowledge to be dangerous to myself and those around me. But I had enough generalized knowledge to do the role, which I was hired to do, which was run the Pemina Institute's consulting business. David, what about you? I think it's just fantastic that there are lots of people like Mike jumping in from, uh, from IT. And, and I think some of them really will have a big impact. And, and, and maybe Mike and, and Padre Hydrogen will. But I think there really are really big structural differences between the way IT businesses work and the way most kind of energy businesses work, which is really a commodity business about a certain kind of hardware development uh, that can really look quite different. I think that we, we, we desperately need people to come in, but I do think that that some level of, of knowledge about some piece of the space, which may not be anything that was related to climate or energy, but it's something about a certain kind of hardware or a certain kind of business or about the science, I think really does matter for, for hurting the bits together. Maybe I'll, res I'll respond to that. So, so this question of the, you know, IT skills and what is transferable, I guess I see a big difference between some of the, you know, what I would call hard tech type stuff like direct, you know, carbon removal or really you're building that technology. I do think, though, that we are starting to see some of the more software based solutions in other areas becoming important. Right. So, you know, Nest with their virtual power plant and kind of being able to aggregate some of the demand response, say, from. Uh, heating and air conditioners, uh, I think is, is one example of an area that it lends itself more to some of those types of software skills. I think it's fair to say that, you know, those things are still scaling up, but I guess I would, I would point to kind of a range of different kinds of businesses that, that could exist in that space. For sure. There's a bunch of the energy business that is software. And for that coming from that, to me, I absolutely agree with you, but to me, that kind of proves my point. It's not really an exception. That is, that is, of course, if you're coming into the software parts of the energy business, like demand management and interface with the grid, where there's just fantastic things happening, and then coming from a software background makes total sense. I, it, but I'll go back to, to Mike's point. One of the things he said is he came in and sure, he had software experience, but he just had experience with finance, with HR, with fundraising, and will definitely need those skills. So I see all that when I look at clean energy and I think those general managerial skills, they're not any particularly different. They're not particularly different from other sectors. And you need people, you need professionals coming in with those kinds of backgrounds. And especially if, you know, for the startups, if they're going to be successful, you need to know, you need people who know how to start companies and, and grow them. So yeah, software to clean Tech may be less transferable, but just startup to startup, I think is more transferable.
Hey, it's Janice Chan, the CEO for Canon Energy. And my advice for breaking into the clean energy world is to follow the money. Investors spend a lot of time thinking about where growth the trends are in the sector. Uh, so look at where investors are putting their money into companies, into different industries, and look to see if you can contribute to those companies and sectors. My second piece of advice would be to think about what you're uniquely good at, what skills you have, and then bring it into the sector. The clean energy economy needs lawyers, marketing people, engineers, all types of skill sets. So whatever you're good at, that's probably a place for you. So just don't be afraid, make the jump, and we'll see you on the other side. I, I love the clarity of that. And I think there's a lot to that follow the money and especially as you're starting. But I also think it's important to say, follow the fundamentals. I wouldn't have started carbon engineering if I was following the money. So my advice would be think really hard about where the puck is going, what the fundamental drivers are and, and try and go there. You know, I've got some specific advice on that great Canadianism, David, to follow where the puck is going. So I'm a mentor with the Creative Destruction Lab, and it's a group of people who get together and they help to mentor startups. I'm part of the energy stream. And there are, I don't know, dozens, if not a hundred or so mentors. And unlike me, many of these people are hardcore investors who have seen the different cycles and seen the fads come and go and the hype cycles, they've gone up and down it. And if, if you do want to follow the money, but not just in a lemming like way, I think you could go to that site, find a mentor in your neighborhood, take him or her out for a three martini lunch and, and pick their brains. Because I've, I've just been impressed with the people there and it seems like they have some really good experience. Three martini lunches, I think, are kind of a thing of the 50s, Ed. But, but other than that, I agree with you. Well, I, I, so I, I, <laughs> I've never actually had a three martini lunch. And I think my good. entire get some honesty. corporate career, I've had one drink at lunch. But I like the idea of a well, three maybe, martini maybe lunch. Well, maybe one time we could have an energy and climate lunch where the three of us have a three martini lunch, but maybe that's just one each. I, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm in. Sounds you good. Ended, Sarah? No, I'm I'm there. Then and then we record uh we record the lunch. Yeah. I, I do like so so Janice didn't share too much about her company, Canon Energy. So I did just want to mention something about that because I think that ties a little bit to to following the money in this discussion. So what they are doing um is looking for ways to bring in finance to uh, get what are high value energy generation and emission reduction projects, but that are somehow too small for the industrials and the utilities to sort of bother with managing. And so I think that's a really interesting, I mean, that that to me is interesting in a lot of ways. I, I love how as a company, they're trying to tackle one some of the non-technology barriers to a deployment. But it also, I think it shows a little bit that like when we talk about following the money, it doesn't necessarily mean that where things are not happening, you know, there isn't actually an interest there. But it, but it's sort of about trying to figure out what investors would be willing to support if only there was the way to make that happen. So, so I think to me that puts a little bit of a color on what uh, on on what she's saying and what they're trying to do. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how that develops here uh, in Alberta. My name is Tim Weiss, and I'm an industrial professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Alberta, where much of my research is looking at renewable energy development in the Alberta electricity market. And so as a result, many of the undergraduate students often come up to me and ask me how they can get into renewable energy as they're about to graduate and begin their careers. And the simple advice that I give to them is that just get into the electricity sector in general. All electricity companies, whether they know it or not, are renewable energy companies. And what I mean by that is that renewable energy has now become so low cost uh, and much lower risk compared to its fossil fuel counterparts that have emissions associated with them, that renewable energy is just becoming so ubiquitous that it's going to be the future of any electricity company, whether it's on the generation side or even on the distribution or even the transmission side, perhaps, uh, where it's going to be looking at things with integration of renewables, storage, market development, all those types of things. And so getting into the sector in general is going to lead you to uh, renewable energy. 
I love this. It reminds me of that meme with the like two astronauts and the one is saying, you know, it's all renewable energy. And the other one says it always has been. I don't know. Maybe I spend too much time on Twitter. But but I, I think Tim makes a really interesting point around, you know, there are some big sectors that are really sort of as a whole moving into that space. And I think actually for me, that brings up another point when people are thinking about careers within the low carbon energy field. And that is sort of like it's a lot of different things, right? It's very different to say that you want to work for, you know, a big utility because that, you know, electrification and and low carbon electricity is obviously going to be a key component of our addressing the climate crisis versus, you know, working at a startup or, or other kind of place. And so I think it's really important for people that are interested in the field, you know, it's it's great if you are able to build a career where you are somehow intrinsically motivated by the broader goal that you're striving for. But at the same time, that day-to-day grind of what you're doing is, you know, I think a big part of what makes people happy or not. And so I'd really encourage people that are thinking about wanting to be in this space to then think the next step and sort of, you know, what does that really mean? What kind of areas? And, And there's, I think, a lot of different ways that that can lead you. I thought the comment that the electricity sector is the renewable world is just so close to correct. I mean, yeah, there are going to be some other things, but I really think it's going to dominate. And I like the fact that you mentioned transmission. So, you know, on this uh, show several times, I've tried to point out that if you really want cheap solar, you should build it somewhere sunny and and run the, the, run the sun by wire. And uh, Sarah and I have had a back and forth about that. These things are really moving. Like x has a serious proposal for bringing 10 gigawatts of solar from Morocco to the UK. There's a proposal that also is moving for bringing uh, power from Australia to Singapore. And the Chilean government, in a way that I think is clearly not serious now, but raised the possibility of selling to Japan by an undersea link across the Pacific, where they get this huge time of day difference. And I really do think that that, I, I think that more than batteries may be where it moves. And that is really about the electric sector being global in a way it never was before. Yeah, I'd like to say two things in this conversation that I've heard are bang on. One, Sarah, you do spend too much time on Twitter. And and two, Tim is right. I don't know of any power generator worth its salt that isn't involved in renewables. And yes, that's the future. But I will say, I think there's a huge difference between working for an incumbent or or even like an oil and gas company that's playing in the renewable space versus a pure play renewables company. And with the incumbents, you might get the bigger balance sheets. They're probably just more job opportunities. But from my experiences, that can come at the expense to the employee of bureaucracy or being fleet of foot or frankly being innovative or working with a bunch of petrochemical engineers that are trying to evaluate big combined solar storage projects. So I'm personally a fan of the pure play renewables companies. I think They're the ones who are crafting the most interesting projects and frankly, coming up with some of the most interesting deals, even if they, on an employee basis, they're microscopic compared to some of these incumbents. Hi, I'm Meredith Adler, the Executive Director of Student Energy. We're a global organization working with 50,000 youth in over 120 different countries. What we see the need for is a real standardization and scaling of how we do experiential learning to train people on sustainability skills. We know that the sustainability landscape and green jobs are ever evolving, and we need to prepare young people better for this. So this involves going outside of the university system and making sure that young people have the opportunity to both manage funds, manage projects, and really sink their teeth into how we do this work. This is so great. I mean, one of the just thrills is teaching. And in my experience, especially coming back after COVID, back to Harvard, facing, I guess, classroom fulls of students who are taking my energy systems class and really want to work in the space, they're the future. And that level of kind of young energy to just go do stuff, not what us old people tell them to do, but what they want to do in the space is the most important thing. Yeah, this, what Meredith says, and very well said, Meredith, reminds me There's a a report that came out that the government of Canada released, a future skills program report in March 2021. And essentially, the report says, for what we need to do, there is a human capacity gap between existing traditional education programs at the university and college level and what companies need in terms of the leadership skills to the hands-on management skills for them to be part of the energy transition. 
and organizations, not just in the private sector, but in the public and, and civil society sectors as well. So I'm, I've been big on micro-credentials. And in fact, I create an NGO that's all about creating a micro, uh, micro-credential around transition leadership. Um, and a lot of those micro-credentials, not to disparage my two co-hosts here, both university professors, I see some of the, the best work, I think, being offered at the college level. Yeah, and I, I don't take that as a disparagement. You know, I think that the university system and the college systems, as you know, as Meredith suggests, I think are are also just kind of, in some sense, waking up to the need to do experiential learning and really learning in an environment that is fast paced in a different way. And I mean, that's something that I think a lot about at the Masters of Sustainable Energy Development program that I direct at the University of Calgary. And this question of how do you prepare students with the skills to enter an energy system that is in transformation and that is going to look, we know, or certainly at least we hope, uh, very different in, you know, 20 years, even 10 years than it does today. And there has to be less teaching in some cases of sort of, you know, the facts and this is the way things work and more teaching of understanding how to learn really and how to learn new skills when they come up in the real world and also how to manage under this uh, great levels of uncertainty. It's a different way to be in a business in that situation. So I think there's a lot of different types of skills that are needed for, for that changing environment. Yeah, partly it's about getting the balance right between seat time and education. And in this future skills report, I I mentioned employers are saying we're getting people without enough seat time. And when I say I like micro-credential programs or micro-credentials, one of the things I, I like about them is that emphasis on experiential learning, kicking people out of the classroom and forcing them to get that experience. Maybe the single biggest piece of advice I give people is to really think about what they actually like to do day to day. Because as much as your job is partly about what field it's in, whether it's in clean energy or finance or making a lot of money or bombing the world, in the end, you've got to figure out what you actually like to do hour by hour. And and so do you actually like to sit alone at your desk or are you somebody who's all about being social? Do you like to work with tools, you know, kind of do physical work or do you want to do more computers? Are you really good at writing? And I think it's really crucial that people think through what actually makes them feel good as they work. And then they can think about how to blend that with what career they want to do. But I think people should be wary about forcing themselves in a place because they kind of think it's conceptually the right thing for them into a place that might not actually be something that is rewarding to them personally day to day. I have violent agreement with you on that, David. That's definitely something that I talk with people um, about first and foremost, because I think it's really you know, this big picture only takes you so far in terms of getting up in the morning and, and going to work. And so I, I would layer onto that, you know, also, what are you good at? Right. And so if you yeah. if you really love doing something, but you're really not good at doing it, then, you know, maybe that's more of a hobby and, and not a career. But I think, yeah, I just like I said, violent agreement. I mean, it's more to say that the energy sector or clean energy jobs is is still an aggregation of basically the same human skills. So so in the energy sector jobs, the skills are a set of trade skills, a set of lawyer skills, a set of salesperson skills, a set of writing skills, a set of uh, computational skills. I'm probably missing some, but that's not that different from other sectors. So in the end, you've got to have a skill and then figure out which sector you're going into. Yeah, I, I would add that a good advice that I got at the start of my career is someone said, and I, I do this kind of like two of you do policy work amongst the many things you do. And he said, you got to pick the jurisdiction that sort of most gets you up in the morning. And for some, that could be working very locally. You're working to solve local problems. For some, maybe that's regionally or provincially. Or for some, that's nationally or internationally. And that can span sectors. But just find that area, that zone of influence that just gets you out of the bed and gets you rocking in the morning. Yeah, I think, I think, I think, I think the ideal job And I think you said it just right, but I think the ideal job is really a combination of the two. You need to be in a sector where it gets you rocking in the morning, where you actually really want to be part of doing whatever you're doing. Uh, But you also need to be actually day-to-day doing something you like to do. And to me, the good job is the combination of those two things. So maybe I'll approach the question from a little bit of a, how do you do this? So, you know, assuming you know what you want to do, you have an idea of where you want to go, how do you actually make it happen? And I think there, you know, certainly taking a, a a bit of a longer view is important and and 
I think for me, that comes from a little bit of my own, you know, history moving into this space. So I, I come from the academic space. I have a physics background in something totally unrelated to energy. But, you know, I think the the sort of technological familiarity and, and some of those problem solving skills are helpful. I then went and worked um, at McKinsey for a number of years in the energy space. I worked also with, you know, conventional fossil fuel companies also there before going to Pemina to work on the policy side. And, you know, reflecting back on those experiences and what I do now, I would say that very much my my learning, you know, started obviously in school, but it didn't stop there. And it continued through that experience, you know, consulting and working with companies as well as in the policy space. And so you know, there can be, I think, especially if you talk with people that are more established in the field, it can be a little bit intimidating or a little bit you feel like, well, you know, how can I possibly get from where I am today to to being there in the future? And it's a little bit like that elephant eating, you know, how do you eat an elephant? You start with the first bite. And I think there's something to that with the with the clean energy space as well, too, where it's not about, you know, getting all the way to the the end in, in two or three years, but but kind of building up those skills that you need and finding ways, obviously, to be interested and be employed and meet all the other things that you need to be doing when you're working along the way. Um, but that long term view and then finding ways. I mean, of course, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'll, I'll admit my bias as the director of this program, but I think that programs like the Sustainable Energy Development Master's Program at the University of Calgary, as well as others that, you know, that exist that are really aimed at helping people to do that skill transferring piece. And, you know, what I think, I guess one of my beliefs is that the challenges in transitioning our energy system in the time that we have are ones that really combine, you know, technological challenges and, and business challenges and economic challenges. And so that people that have deep expertise in more than one of those really have something special to bring, not just in the skills that they have in one area, but in able to, being able to kind of combine those. And so I think that especially looking for for programs, if you're thinking about going back to school, that can kind of really help you to to create that link and to sort of link what you know and what your experience is if you're coming from the workforce already into something new, not as sort of and leaving the old behind, but but actually taking that along. And that can be, in some cases, again, a technical skill or, you know, economics well or, or finance or something like that. But it can also be sort of softer skills, like you understand the culture of how, you know, a certain sector of the energy economy works. And, and that culture piece is really important, again, for getting deals done and getting projects built. And so having that kind of experience can can be very valuable. One key lesson is the skills and the topic can be very different. So I felt like I got the core skills that I used in getting carbon engineering going, actually working as a postdoc at Harvard on a really complicated hardware build. We were building something totally different, a, a thing to measure temperatures from space. And we flew on a Haldun aircraft, but it was sort of a 10-person team with electrical engineers, mechanical engineers. You know, I had to actually deal with a whole bunch of external contracts. I mean, while it was a not-for-profit, it's inside Harvard. It's like kind of running a business. And it was a similar kind of total money scale to the early days of, of carbon engineering. And to me, that whole kind of management and small team, technical team skill was exactly what allowed me to do carbon engineering, even though the actual topic was completely different. Yeah, I think that's really key. And I know, I don't know how you felt, David, but certainly coming out of my PhD, I didn't feel like I had learned a lot of those kind of skills, right? Those were things I needed to pick up either, you know, in my case, it was sort of via the job, but I think often that's what professional programs that are more business focused can also help people to do. Yeah, I think the lucky part for me of experimental physics, both my PhD and that amazing postdoc was just a lot of hardware. So in practice, in both the PhD and the postdoc, I designed electronics, actually engineered them. I did welding, I did machine shop, I did the design, I did contracting, and that all those set of skills, each of the individual ones, are what allowed me to be involved in the other technical pro projects. Yeah, I, that I makes found sense. The, I, I, I found the same with my career progression. And I ran a small conservation office, and in that office, I did everything from testifying before parliamentary committees to launching environmental lawsuits to dealing with difficult hires, hiring and firing to fixing the photocopier. And in the work that I did running the Peminence Institute, it was just a leveling up of all those things that I'd learned along the way at just a larger scale. But Sarah, I want to pick up on, on your point because you're a great example of your career trajectory, not starting in clean energy, but now being in clean, low carbon energy. And when we worked together at the Peminence Institute, 
although you were already in the sector, I could see you had a key skill that allowed you to make that trajectory. And that key skill for such a nice person like you is being able to elbow your way into conversations. And sometimes I'd say showing up really is half the battle. And you are a good person at, you know, saying, I want to be part of this. Here's a discussion. I have something to say. I'm going to learn from this. And you would elbow your way into that room without being invited. And whenever you did that, you were always welcome because you had so much to contribute. So, hey, everyone out there, be careful. Sarah has some pretty sharp elbows, but has done her well in life. You know, one, this is really great. I think one thing that, that both your story and mine, Ed, is about the way in which if you're running a really small shop, it forces you to learn all the skills. So, you know, I really did spend a lot of time actually soldering and vacuum sealing and doing electronics. And then when I came to be doing something slightly bigger, I could supervise those skills because I knew just enough about them. So I'm not a software engineer, but I've written lots of code. And that gives me some idea to, you know, how I can coordinate people doing it now. And, and I feel like that's something you get when you're in a, in a really tiny little shop that has to do everything that you probably don't in general get if you're playing in a really big company where you're more focused on the narrow skill you're really good at. That's what I'd find is people sometimes, they end up getting pigeonholed into one role in a big company. And I saw that when I did my grad studies, as opposed to being in a smaller place where you do everything, including fixing the photocopier. And frankly, when I'd hired, I'd look for those people coming in with the more general skill sets, because I knew then I could deploy them in a whole bunch of different situations. Instead of just, you're good at this, you're good at analysis, or you're just good at writing, but I can send you into a team of engineers and have you facilitate a good workshop. So I, I hired Kenton Heidel, who's now the, one of the top engineers at Carbon Engineering, because we were building a, a big complicated thing that had some risk, like the, you know managing saws. <laughs> Somebody could have been hurt, and I just had a team of two or three people doing it. And I hired him because he had worked on a farm and worked with tools a lot. And so I judged correctly that he had good kind of common sense with his tools and was unlikely to hurt himself, and he was fantastic. That's an interesting one, David. I was thinking about this idea of like, how you can differentiate yourself by having a skill that might not be as uh, typical coming from a certain background. And maybe that's sort of an example of it. I don't know, maybe that's stretching the analogy, but, you know, thinking about communication, right? I think uh, you and I, David, come from a, a, the scientific area where I think fairly people often say that that scientists aren't always good communicators no. uh, and good at speaking to the public. I know. Can you believe it? I no, mean, they, we wouldn't ever say that, would they? I, I've heard such things. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm married to another scientist and I think we, we talk to each other just fine. But, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so how do you find ways? And I think that communication piece is so key, whether it's communicating to the public or within an organization to be successful. And I think for my part, it was really looking for ways to learn those skills very directly, right? Like with a lot of feedback and, and there were different, you know, in, in different jobs that looked different. But, but really, the biggest one for me was actually communicating, trying that and then getting people telling me, you know, really directly, no holds barred, you know, here's what you're doing wrong and here's how to fix it. And so being really open to that and, and approaching it, really wanting to learn, I think for me, that is what helps to improve my own communication skills. I, I, I will say about scientists and communicating, the late, great David Schindler, who might have been the finest aquatic scientist who ever worked in this country, once told me, I work in a department of 55 professors and I would trust two of them to go out and publicly communicate their research findings. And I'm one of them. <laughs> and, and he was right. And he was a brilliant communicator. I know for me, and, you know, never discount the skills that you pick up outside of your profession and how that can apply. I was 20 years ago, part of an improv group called the Flukes of Nature. Well, one of our members is now the mayor of Canmore. That has served me so well in life. And I'd have friends look at me with a mixture of sympathy and concern when we'd be doing these funky outdoor improv shows for an audience of 12 and a half. But the skills that I picked up communicating allowed me to get in front of a group or my organization or whatever it was and know that you fake it until you make it and you don't always need that script. So <laughs> get those skills from outside of work and apply them. I listen to, have... um, okay, go ahead. Uh, can we have really an fun. energy versus climate improv uh, session? Is that going to be the next podcast special? We'll, we'll <laughs> Maybe start after with energy the martini transfer. lunch. <laughs> energy transfer, Sarah. We're there. Um, a great climber, Mark Twight, had a really clever line that when you're starting something new and learning, you need some combination of humility and then hubris. And it's this delicate mixture of the two. 
when you're learning your way into something, you need to be really humble that you don't know a lot and you need to be honest about how little you know. And that's what makes you ask a lot of questions and really know. And then if you're just humble all the time, you won't get anywhere. You need some level of, of, of hubris, of almost overconfidence to then start doing something with that knowledge. But then you somehow need to swing back and forth. And to me, that really captures what it takes to get into a new field is some, some, some balancing back and forth between the humility to learn a lot and the hubris to actually try something. Yeah. Now, I want to talk about the advice that I used to give to people. Well, I shouldn't say the advice I still give to people. But when people would come to me and say, how can I get a job with your organization? I say, fundamentally, I look for two things. I look for capacity for critical thought and culture fit. I frankly didn't give a rat's ass about someone's GPA or the yep. schools they went to. Yep. None of that would impress me. No offense to you two professors with prestigious universities. But what I really cared about was your ability to think critically, your ability to show me that you can think critically. And then from your volunteer experience, I knew that your heart was there. And that was important to me because that meant that you would be around, you would show up on Monday morning, not just when times were good, but then times were bad because I had that direct evidence of your heart being in the right place. So as well, never please discount the value of going and volunteering for your local NGO because cranky pants employers like myself would look at that and would actually seek that out in a CV. What I've learned to think about hiring is fit, skill, and will. So to me, fit is how somebody fits culturally into the organization, how, how you know they like the same kind of hanging out the same way, socializing and skill or whatever, some kind of skills they have. And then will is like just the edge of like how much they just want to get shit done. And those seem like the three key things you look for. And skill is just one of the three and not the dominant. But I would say with skill, I would look for three skills, if you can call them yeah. that. One is the skill to work in environments with high levels of ambiguity. The second was to work with sporadic direction and still make a good job of it. And the third skill is willingness to accept a below market salary. You knit those three together and you're going to go far. <laughs> I'm not sure that's a skill. <laughs> maybe a privilege. Well, the three of us could keep on riffing and maybe we should actually book ourselves a three martini lunch. But we got a lot more advice uh, and audio clips from people that we just didn't have time to respond to. We'd like to play them for you all so you don't miss a, a single word of that advice. And we're going to start with Jim Sandercock of the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. When you think about the full service clean energy professional, they need to provide the customer optimized low carbon solutions by pulling from a full toolkit of options. The engineering, designing and deployment of solutions involves a lot of different technologies. And you know, the list goes from everything from solar to geothermal, building envelope to microgrid solutions and lots of technologies in between. But successful deployment also involves the application of business and economic skills, as well as having life cycle thinking. So how does a current professional retool their career to move into the clean energy industry? In terms of opportunity cost, we're hearing that people are saying being out of the job market for a full four years is just too much. So by offering a highly focused two-year diploma, people can gain the deep skills that are needed by a clean energy professional in a short period of time. In the broad strokes for our program at Nate, it starts with the technology basics in the first two semesters, brings together concepts in the third semester, things like hybridization, economics, project management, and then caps it off with highly interdisciplinary topics in the fourth term, topics like building energy hybridization, microgrids, ESG, and industry-based capstone projects where you'll actually work with a company on a project. If after the first two-year diploma, people find that they still need a management degree, they can bolt onto their diploma with just two more years, the Bachelor of Technology Management, which runs mainly in evenings and weekends. My name is Julia Maria Becker, and I'm the manager of sustainable business and operations at the Royal Bank of Canada. I'm responsible for helping to achieve commitments to source 100% renewable and non-emitting electricity within our global operations by 2025. I started my career in low carbon energy working for nonprofits that focus on clean energy transition. One of them was the Pembina Institute. So this gave me great exposure to learn about policies necessary for a successful transition, a lot of responsibilities in an early stage of my career and great opportunities to network. So I can definitely recommend starting at a small but mighty think tank or nonprofit. 
I think it is key to always stay educated on what the current thought leadership is and learn from the leaders, corporations, governments, nonprofits, on what ambitiousness looks like in our ever-evolving sector. Another key thing is to have a network you know you can rely on when you have questions and need help or want to bounce off some ideas or learn about the next job opportunity. Hi, I'm Eric St. Pierre, Executive Director of the Trotze Family Foundation, a private climate philanthropic funder. First, my advice to someone starting out or transitioning their career in the low-carbon energy sector is to become passionate about this work. Be engaged in the issues that you really care about Read about it on your spare time, engage with organizations, and find ways to connect with others in this space. Do it because you want to, not because you have to. Second, volunteering and getting involved is a great way to build your network. And this is key to finding both job opportunities and being effective once you are in. If you follow the passion piece, you will be naturally led to meeting others in this space. Get out there, meet folks, volunteer, sign up for newsletters of organizations you admire, follow them on Twitter, join webinars on issues you're interested in, and reach out through LinkedIn. There are lots of learning and networking opportunities, and this is a great strategy to get to know the key players and learn about them. Third, when you're just getting started, it's challenging to build experience, so don't hesitate to get involved. Don't wait for things to land on your doorstep. Go out and get it. Likewise, if you are transitioning, like I transitioned six years ago from being a lawyer into climate philanthropy, don't be afraid to learn. Gain experience and have confidence, and don't forget to have fun. Lastly, thank you for considering a career in energy and climate. The crisis is urgent and we need all hands on deck, including young people entering the sector and others transitioning into the sector. This is an exciting field that is rapidly expanding. And remember, be passionate, connect with others, get involved, and let's solve this climate crisis. Hi, my name is Terry Lynn Duke, and I'm the Director of Strategic Innovation with NMAX Power. I work in the transmission and distribution sector, and we provide electricity services to all Calgarians. And I would say, if you're looking at getting into the electricity sector, there has never been a more exciting time. In our 100-year history, we have never seen change happen this rapidly. There really is a global disruption that is happening within this sector, and we are just on the cusp of seeing some of these things happen in Alberta. And what I would say is with disruption comes amazing opportunity. So we're seeing the growth of adoption of both large and small scale renewables, and we're seeing customers fuel switch to electric vehicles. And we're addressing all of this through digital first and customer centric solutions. And really what we're looking for is a diversity of thought and innovative problem solving, because some of these things can be quite challenging and being able to balance, you know, bringing in new technologies into a grid, building a two way power flow on a system that was originally designed to be a single one way direction. We're looking for people who are going to bring their unique talents to the table, people who can challenge the status quo and who can stay curious. And so the advice I usually give to people who are looking to make an impact within this sector is think big, start small, just start. And one way to get started is do your research. Start reading up about what's going on in terms of the global trends in the electricity sector and what's happening here in Alberta. And the next piece after that is reach out to your network. Utilize you know, systems like LinkedIn and connect with people that are in the industry and start meeting with them and asking questions specifically about their roles so you can get a better understanding of where you might fit and where you may be able to add that value. I'm David Kelly, CEO and founder of Skyfire Energy, a Western Canadian-based solar EPC headquartered in Calgary, Alberta. I've been in the solar industry for 20 years and have seen many changes and massive growth in those years. For anyone looking to get into the industry, I recommend learning about the technology and how it works. Technical institutions, software providers, and some of the equipment suppliers are offering training for electricians, installers, sales, engineering, operations, and maintenance technicians. The construction trades already have the transferable skills for large-scale solar projects on the civil works and mechanical installations. Solar is a growing energy source around the world and works at different scales from residential rooftop to utility-scale projects. There are many opportunities to participate from installation, construction, procurement, project management, engineering, logistics, accounting, marketing, and most other roles you'd find in a construction business. Bringing a passion for renewable energy and a willingness to learn and work with others is what we look for in new employees. 
growing from a very small company to where we are today, the ability to take on many different tasks has been a valuable asset to keep projects moving forward. Hi, Energy versus Climate World. My name is Anna Stukas, and I am a Vice President of Business Development at Carbon Engineering. As any of you who are frequent listeners to the show will know, here at Carbon Engineering, we are working to commercialize direct air capture technology to take carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere at climate relevant scales. So when it comes to advice on careers in the clean energy world, the first thing that I generally start with is that the technology I'm working on today didn't even exist yet when I was in school. You can't predict where innovation is going to go. So instead of trying to predict exactly what path your career is going to take, focus on keeping an open mind to new opportunities and saying yes to opportunities that get you genuinely excited. You never know where it might lead. I would add the caveat that my career path has followed what one might call unconventional job-seeking processes. In my last year of my undergraduate degree, we had an incredibly compelling guest lecturer come and tell us all about a new fuel cell startup company he had just founded. And at the end of that lecture, he happened to mention that he had two job postings available. I quite literally chased him out into the parking lot and told him that he just had to hire me. Fortunately for me, that approach worked and was the beginning of a dozen-year-long adventure in fuel cell and hydrogen technologies. In a similar vein, my time at Carbon Engineering started after I met our former CEO at an alumni conference and spent much of the evening convincing him that I was the right person for him to add to his small team at that time. Six and a half years later, I'm so thankful that I had that opportunity. With that caveat out of the way, my advice, if you're looking for a career in clean technology or the clean energy industry, would be to focus on starting with what feeds your curiosity. Learn more. Ask questions. Listen to podcasts like Energy versus Climate. Read books like The Citizen's Guide to Climate Success. Learn what an energy system is, noting that nowhere near enough people actually do. And then recognize that nearly every single clean technology out there is hiring like mad these days and looking for good people. So identify your transferable skills. Recognize that we need everything from process engineers to accountants to IT and HR specialists. And most of these companies are also out there every single day doing webinars, podcasts, and interviews. So watch them, figure out what excites you, and then put together applications that let your passion shine through. This industry is growing and incredibly exciting, and we need more people. I, for one. I'm hopeful that we will see a world in 2050 that actually meets the vision painted by Dr. Julio Friedman in the Energy Futures Workshop at COP last week, which he started by saying, in 2050, the number one job in the world will be carbon wrangling. That's it for this episode. We hope you enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. I know that we did. We'll be back live next time to give you a U.S. policy update with Jody Freeman professor at Harvard Law School and the former counselor for energy and climate change in the Obama White House. Thanks for listening to Energy versus Climate. The show is created by David Keith, Sarah Hastings Simon, and me, Ed Whittingham, and produced by Eva Voynijescu. Mika McFarland provides webinar support. Our title and show music is The Windup by Brian Lips. Sign up for updates and exclusive webinar access at energyversusclimate.com. Interact with us live every other week and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen.